A very good morning. We're glad you're still with us here on Morning at 10 TV. We are now diving straight into the Kickstarter discussion where we shall be discussing the life of General Eli Tumine Fair, the well historical and of course one of the men that uh, fought the guerrilla war between 1981 and 1980 five or 86 specifically uh, that brought the national resistance army into power that later morphed into the national resistance uh, movement uh, yesterday on monday the 29th of august a national prayer service was held at the kololo independence grounds for general elite Tumine, where politicians uh, government officials and uh, friends and family eulogized the general and of course uh, gave their recollections on who the man was to them and of course uh, his uh, legacy in their lives so on the show this morning we are of course going to understand the latest in terms of uh, our plans of course we do know right now that his body was airlifted to uh, Barunga in Kazo district that is his ancestral home where his remains are due to be interred later today into internal repos and uh, joining me for the discussion is uh, the minister for ICT and uh, national guidance uh, Dr. Chris Bariomusi uh, many thanks for making time Thank you very much, and good morning, viewers. Uh, I'm happy to be here this morning. Okay. Uh, also joining me on the show is Henry Chitambula, the Deputy Resident uh, District Commissioner for Mukono. Many thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. I salute the, vo the viewers, and uh, yes, those specifically those from Mukono, because that's where I, I work. Yeah. And uh, they have always really loved NTV. Okay. They love NTV. We're glad to and they, uh, keep up the good work. All right, thank you very much. I would like to begin with you, Dr. Chris Variamosi. On uh, today's uh, very last day for General Eli Tumine to be with us, he will be interred into eternal repose a little bit later after a service that will allow the residents of uh, his ancestral home to be able to pay last uh, respects. Uh, just tell us about exactly what will be happening and uh, the details, for example, on uh, the honors, the military honors and every uh, tradition or protocol that is expected uh, later today. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. First of all, we once again convey our condolences to the family and all Ugandans upon the loss of General Eri Tumine, <coughs> who died at the age of 68 years and uh, by all standards very he was still young. Yeah. So we expected much more from him, but unfortunately God has called him. Yes, today is the day that we are going to lay him to rest. As probably everybody knows, yesterday the body was thrown to Kazo, and today, starting at around 10, there will be a requiem service at his home in the Kazo, Kazo, and that will precede the burial, which should take place in the afternoon. Mm. And he will be buried with all the military honors, the general in the UPDF, you will get a 17 gun salute and uh, all that accompanies the military honors as mm. we bury him. Okay. Y yes. Our condolences to the people of Kazo and uh, particularly the family. Mm -hmm. the all right, uh, before I transition to uh, Mr. Henry Chitambula, there were concerns mm -hmm. or questions that were raised as to why General Eli Tumine was not laid in state mm -hmm. in Parliament to be able to allow members of Parliament to eulogize and also pay respects to him. What informed the decision for that? Mm. There were discussions between the government UPDF and the family, mm. but uh, I think the major consideration was that the government is uh, the position of government that those today in the state and maybe the bodies be taken to parliament, uh, but surely those who are sitting members of parliament. Mm. And he had left parliament. So what was agreed upon is that yes, that the burial take place, and then the parliament can pay tributes to him even when we have already laid him to rest. So a motion at an appropriate time will be moved in the parliament, and members of parliament shall have an opportunity to pay tribute to our former colleague. Mm. 
Okay. So, so nothing much should be read into, into <laughs> this. Into this. Uh, for the state funeral, mm -hmm. the law prescribes who uh, is entitled to a state funeral. It basically, it's a head of state or former head of state, vice president, a speaker, deputy speaker, chief justice, the top high ranking. Mm. And uh, for the other VIPs, they get official uh, burials. But taking the body to parliament, we're now restricting it to sitting members of parliament. Uh, so, and he had ceased being a member of parliament. Okay. Yes. Uh, just a little bit of that's detail. That's the major reason. That's a little bit of detail on that particular piece of legislation. Yes. Uh, they restricting mm. the uh, laying in state mm. in parliament for uh, former uh, members and only uh, coding that to sitting mm. or members who die while they are still. still. Is that something that has already been worked on? How far are we? Is it an act that is going to be passed? It is being worked on. Mm. It is the policy position coming from government mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to be tabled soon. Because in the past there has been confusion at yeah. times who goes, who doesn't. And one time we were embarrassed. We were in the parliament, I think a judge died. Mm. And there was a lack of coordination. The body was brought to Parliament. When we were seated in the Parliament, they said there is a body of a judge outside. And the Parliament was not aware, so the body had to be taken back. So it was a little bit of uh, some confusion. So it's going to be streamlined through a very clear law. Okay. So that uh, everybody knows who is entitled, who is not. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, all right, uh, Henry Chitambula, yes, when you heard of the demise of uh, the general, a historical member of the National Resistance Movement, one of the most hostile military leaders in the country, what was your reaction? Mm, of course, I was, uh, I, I was, I was shocked. Uh, first of all, I convey my condolences to the family, uh, the commander the chief, His Excellency Yuri Kakutam Seven. Uh, the UPDF mm. and all Ugandans because this is really a very, a very, very big loss. Uh, I knew uh, General Eritomwine uh, for some time and I'm uh, a few other DCs, I'm among the few, the very mm. few, who got a chance and I was visited by the General when I was still the deputy at a CC company in charge of machine. Mm. And we sat for four full hours in office. Uh, I remember as we were discussing on a few things, by the way, I learned a lot from him. Mm. He gave me, he, he challenged me a little bit. Uh, I was working in the area, but there was some people who are doing arts and crafts and remember that was his field yes yeah he was a very good painter his artist. private field yeah and uh, one of the i don't know how it came i had a calendar in my office and that calendar belonged to uh, lugendo 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 and the sons they in Katwe there mm. so he turned onto the calendar said eh? These are doing all of this because the calendar was showing what they were doing. Lugendo and sons are artisans. Yes. In, okay. So he asked me, how many times have you ever visited these people? Mm. And you know, I'm an honest man. So I told him, you know, <laughs> frankly speaking, <laughs> I have not visited Lugendo and sons, but I know the owner. Mm. And the owner comes here and you interact. He said, no, you must go and see what they do, you find a way of alerting government to assist these people because they are doing a very, very great work. Mm. And you told me, the, you see the, the exchange I'm putting on, mm. I don't buy it from anywhere. I make it myself. It was quite challenging. Then when I gave him the visitor's book, he wrote a statement that I remember and I will never forget it. He said, Henry, you tell whoever you interact with, especially the younger people, that the future belongs to the organized ones. And uh, when I read that statement, I told him, General, what does this statement mean, really? 
said you must talk to the young people. They should get organized if they are to benefit from the future. And he told me the song you normally hear me sing. This is the time we have to fight say that we can have a bright future if mm. I can translate directly from Uganda. Mm. That Kano song, I know no, something like that. Uh, so he said, that song is in line with the comment I've put mm. in your visitor's book. That's right. Now, we continued interacting, and he told me he was a born again. Mm. I asked him, but you're a soldier, you're a general, you're born again. <laughs> he told me Is there he survived, he actually survived death several times. He told me, some of you just look at my eye mm. and you only think the survival was in November 1981. Mm. That was nothing. Okay. Well, that was uh, nothing. So he told me a lot, mm, but he, quickly. what still I remember, when he became the Minister of, uh, of, of, of Security, you know the other DCs, we are the chairpersons of the district security committees. Mm. He shall ask the security budget <laughs> by, <laughs> by 200,000. <laughs> and because we are talking, mm. I asked him, General, why is this slash? He said, you people are just joking. We want accountability. Even what we are leaving for you, every morning you must account. And how do you account? The email is here. Every morning you must send a strip. Uh, we call it a strip, mm. a situation report. Okay. And those are the, by the, up to now, we still give the situation reports on a daily basis, very early in the morning, just because of what he introduced and that All was right. on the side of accountability uh, deputy 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 rdc you will allow me engage uh, the spokesperson of the ministry of defense and uh, veteran affairs brigadier felix Kleige, who is uh, joining us online a very good morning afande Kleige. Uh, good morning brigadier good morning Jim. Yes, uh, we are live on uh, Morning at NTV and uh, of course uh, you're joining us on phone. I would like to ask you what is on ground in as far as uh, today's uh, last uh, rights for the fallen general uh, in uh, Rebicoma in Kazo district. Well, we are just starting to the fuel at the public we will see the past Secondly, of course, the service has and then you will be bringing the people who are here and the And then we shall have the general. We shall have a dance all right, I found Felix Kleige, the general died just weeks before he was due to be officially retired from uh, the military. Uh, I don't know exactly what plans are going, how that is going to happen. Could you just give us an idea, the posthumous retirement exercise? I beg your pardon? It's sort of hard to do for the bandage, but the weeks. Okay. Because the retirement of the moon is too old. So he has to go around the five years and do that so many years. All right, I'm afraid the line to Afande Kleige is a little bit hazy. I hope we can rectify that uh, very, very quickly so that we can be able to have him share a little bit more on uh, his recollection of the life and times of uh, General Eli Twine, of course, uh, being a member of the military and uh, perhaps uh, could have served as his uh, commander. Allow me to return to uh, Dr. Chris Bariomusi, the Minister for ICT and National Guidance. You've been uh, interacting with General 
General Eli Tumwine as a cabinet minister, as a member of parliament, and uh, uh, perhaps at a more uh, comradery level than we may know. Mm -hmm. What is your take on the man's life? What do you take from the fact that he's been your friend and uh, if they asked you his legacy? Yes. Well, General Tumine, mm. first of all, he was the longest serving member of parliament. He has been sitting at parliament since 1986. 1986 okay. uh, till just uh, last year, mm. 2021. Those so are 34 years as a member of parliament, uh, as a legislator. Absolutely, mm. maybe more than 34. Mm. Well, Could be around 35. Well, 35, yeah, yeah, 35. He has been there. And uh, a very passionate and pragmatic legislator. General Tumine was somebody who was very passionate about many causes. Mm. Things like corruption. He was a anti corruption crusader and he really spoke his mind and he supported all efforts mm. to fight corruption, not only in the parliament but in this country. And passionate about many other things, the environment, malaria. I remember one time when he was pushing to start a campaign against malaria. So he had that passion for many things which affect humanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a straight talker, somebody who spoke his mind, whether you get irritated or not. You know, there are many pretenders in this country, in this world, mm -hmm. people who want you to tell them what their ears should hear. Uh -huh. But that was not the general to win. He spoke his mind the way he saw it. Like when he made those comments which people are disparaging him about, when he said, no, the police has a right to shoot you, uh -huh. he was correct. Because during the Kasese conflicts, uh -huh. I saw young boys coming with the pangas to cut armed policemen. Now, if a policeman or a military person is armed, you come with a panga to cut him. Now in your mind, what do you think he's like to react? How is he going to react? Even here during the demonstrations, demonstrations. you saw police uh, officers were attacked. Were attacked. So when he said that, people were condemning him, but basically even international instruments clear the state that the police, the military has a right mm. to defend itself. So he was that kind of straight talker, which sometimes would annoy people. But that was him. That uh, was let's him. keep it at that topic before yeah. you continue with mm. your recollections of yeah. his life. The fact that he was a public figure yes. and a minister for security at that point in time. Yes. Don't you think it was prudent upon him mm. to understand the tone within which he speaks? Because the people he was referring to at that time perhaps mm. were some of them were actually grieving the loss of their loved ones mm -hmm. some of them that could have been killed by what police described as a st at that time as a stray bullets mm -hmm. but the number around to be attributed to stray bullets at that time was a bit wayward don't you think his tone is what betrayed him when it comes to those statements well of course all of us are wired differently eh? mm. we communicate differently eh? mm. yes maybe he may have used the a high tone to a grieving community, but he, on the other side, he was stating what was factual. Mm. I fell into an ambush of those rioters in Ruero. I was coming from Guru. We had a, a meeting of the Central Executive Committee of NRM. Mm. We're coming back. But what I saw, my vehicle was pelted with huge stones. The vehicle of one of the Jim Wes was smashed, the windscreen. And uh, we had to go through that kind of riotous environment. So you, you can imagine also a situation where you saw one of the footages where a rioter had a hammer and was trying to kill off a police lady. Mm. You know, you also have to put yourself in the shoes of the other security people. Mm. In such a situation, somebody has a hammer, is coming to finish you off. Do you lay a red carpet for that person? So maybe the style style of communicating it uh -huh. with what could have hurt people but also people should know what he spoke okay. was not necessarily false or untrue all right continue and with your recollection and, true. and uh, he was a generous man uh -huh. a generous man because sometimes 
people can see the public outlook of someone and maybe form an attitude and so forth. But again, when you interact with someone on one-on-one, -on -one, mm. you find maybe how he appears in the public is different from, from when you interact is. with him. So yeah. he was a guy and the person, very considerate, uh, very generous, and when you spoke to him one-on-one, -on -one, he was uh, very okay, uh, very okay. So I really want to persuade the public not to judge him uh, the way I've seen people make a comment that is on uh, social, social media. media. In any case, who are we to judge people? We should leave it to God to be the one to judge. And uh, okay. if there are any mistakes he committed, he should be forgiven. But he was really somebody who is patriotic. He was a, state, a statesman, in my view. And uh, even looking at his history, somebody who abandoned his teaching profession and then he went into uh, revolutionary work uh -huh. to fight for his country, to join the President Yoweri Museveni. Many people don't have that spirit. People say we are in a struggle when they're just eating chapati in town and so forth and so forth. <laughs> but for someone who's taken that risk, <laughs> to not take that risk and go to the bush, okay. even when he knew many would not come back, mm. Uh, to liberate the country. I think it's something we should credit him for. Okay. Honorable Minister, I'll be returning to you shortly so that we can delve into whether the ideals mm. that the likes of General Eli Tumine went to the bush mm. for mm. are upheld today and that the contradictions that some people might attribute or allude to mm. are something that we should be find ourselves reflecting on as food for thought. But allow me to mm. tackle the aspect of patriotism and the fact that a resident district commissioner as representatives of the president are at the forefront of ensuring that Ugandans first and foremost understand that they ought to be patriotic but also accept the plans and the initiatives that are being put in place by the government to ensure that patriotism is ingrained in the, the communities wherever you are. General Tumine was one who was widely seen as patriotic in public True. because of his uh, many uh, positions and his role, especially when it comes to national events. Yeah. What's your take on that particular legacy and what RDCs like you are doing to ensure that, well, it continues? Mm, of course, uh, I may say we need to do a lot of groundwork, mm. uh, especially now that we are losing very important patriots. Uh, taking an example of Geno Tumwini, whom we are celebrating, uh, Jero Tumwini held a lot of positions in the government, mm. including the cabinet. And uh, when you look at his track record, he has never been involved in any scandal. Are you sure about that? He has never been involved in any scandal. There was a time, for example, allow me just uh, bring this to the fore, where there was uh, a controversy surrounding normal gallery mm. and whether he had uh, paid any uh, rent for that particular building to the tune How of two billion Uganda shillings. How did it end? Efforts to get that money were futile by mm. the government. He told members of parliament mm. that he has never mm. gone into any contract with mm. anybody and asked whoever had that agreement to come forth as a landlord so that he could meet. Was there, so was there a landlord? Because we need to follow some of these issues to mm. the latter. Mm. Were they a landlord? Actually, yeah, challenged them. <laughs> Which invoice have you produced yes. that I've failed to honor? Yes, yes. Because at times, mm. uh, we shouldn't uh, use allegations against clean people mm. and say uh, there were scandals against them. You could ask, for example, how did he acquire the place in the first place, taking over normal gallery? Did he have any documents to that effect? He was asked by Parliament, and there was nothing to that effect. But he also challenged on legal technicalities. Oh, good enough, my boss is here mm. and is a member of parliament. Parliament has committees that look at all of those issues. Okay. So we should get the conclusion of the committee before I make any further comment on that. All right. As far as I'm concerned, he's a man who has not been involved in scandals. In fact, you're even pointing out one which is not even mm. <laughs> clear, you see. So, given his service, patriotic service, I uh -huh. think for us as RDCs, 
we need to ensure that uh, number one ourselves learn from him then number two uh, what the president put in place the initiative uh, on uh, patriotism especially the patriotism schools mm. that, uh, I mean clubs in schools we need really to work so hard to ensure that the younger ones are taught to love their country are taught to love each other are taught to love to love Africa we are trying to get in Mukono because uh, we have uh, we have schools that are organizing patriotism training uh, person have been uh, moving from one school to the other uh, one giving a lecture but also number two passing out the patriots mm -hmm. of course we we have critics people who are criticizing you cannot teach somebody to love the country but even the the, the people we are referring to general to uh, they could have been driven by the people who were there at that time the likes of Nyerere uh, because Nyerere was very patriotic if uh, if you you read uh, about him mm. so they could have been driven by those figures in Africa in East Africa uh, now uh, our situation today because of the politicking because of the politicking many of our people are actually misled they have nothing to learn from the patriots that's mm. why they're even criticizing he, he, my boss is talking of the messages on social media mm. uh, somebody actually it's not even a judgment it's a misjudgment because they are giving judgments out of ignorance i think uh, what we should also do the media should assist us and profile the very important figures in the country before they die people should know who dr christopher yomos is what he has done what is his track record they should know a deputy at DC who was serving them. Who is he? What has he done? What is his, his track record? Okay, because that is, uh, that's when understood. even myself, yeah. even myself, mm. I learned it recently that General El Tumwine and others were behind the designing of the currency notes we are having, including the fifty thousand mm. dollars, which even won an award mm. in in, in twenty eleven. So you are bringing them now when the man has gone. So I think we should learn from this and profile our people, spread the, the information about our people. In fact, when they are around, they can even correct us. They can say, you are telling me I, I did this, but I added this. Say so that we can enrich their profiles for the younger ones to copy. Because the patriotism, we can teach, we can teach, but mm. you must learn. You must learn. You must, must learn from inherent. somebody. Mm. There okay. are people there mm. who want to become generous, but when they see you moderating, they learn. They That's say, right. I want to be like him. What should I do to reach his level? So those are the things we should actually uh, look at. No doubt about that. Uh, allow me ask Dr. Bariomonsi. Mm. There is a popular thought that uh, the generation of uh, historicals, uh, the men who left whatever lifestyle or station in life they were living at that particular moment in time and went for the liberation struggle is steadily and unfortunately are fading away. In this time or epoch, there is need to leave a legacy and perhaps entrench those ideals for which they fought. Now, we must be very honest that many times we find ourselves as a country seeing things that happened in 1980 that caused these historicals to go to war or play out. And in the process when questioned, these very historicals are quick to f fall back on the fact that they sacrificed so much to be at this point and that, well, must not be questioned. Is this the kind of sentiment that we must accept? What are the kind of things which were there in 1980 which you see? Abuse of human rights, high-handedness on the part of the security forces, torture, disappearances, mm -hmm. killings. You know, in science... President Yerim Seven for himself, mm -hmm. and it's on record, he didn't win an election mm -hmm. and went to the bush 
on account of a rigged election mm -hmm. by another party. Mm -hmm. There are reports that some of the elections, and as we report them, we see the irregularities, the violence. These are the very things that took the conscience of these gentlemen out of their form and conditioned what they did. Mm -hmm. How can it be going on and they shouldn't be questioned? You know, in science we say the eye sees what it knows. In other words, if we put you in a microscope, mm. if you are not trained to know how to look at a bacteria or a virus, you will not see anything. <laughs> so similarly, I don't know how old you are. You wear. Say, are you saying we, are, we don't know how to see what no. abuses are? I also don't know how old you were in 1980. But many I wasn't people, born yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> many people who make those commentaries yeah. do not have a fear of how 1980 looked like. I was also not very old. I didn't vote. But I accompanied my father, and I could understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. But of course, you pick most of these from also reading. There is no way somebody who was old enough in 1980, in the 70s and 80s, who knows what was going on, there is no way that person will want to compare that with what is happening today. If you look at the 1980 elections, for instance, and you look at the way we vote today, and then you think there are irregularities. First of all, 1980, the way they were voting, I, I still vividly remember. I went to the polling station in Omukano, where they were voting near my home. There would be boxes. You just go and cast your ballot, and they, afterward they take the boxes to the district to count from there. So even where the counting was taking place, people were not there. Not at the polling station. Not at the polling station. We have constituencies here in Uganda. Like in Uganda, there's a constituency where somebody got 19,000, an MP, then another one got 3,000. They announced the one of 3,000. Could that be somewhere in Uganda? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and many, 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 many examples. Where Paul Mwang, the chairman of the military commission announced that nobody has a right, including the electoral commission, to announce the results. It's only him and the one who had uh, invited the Milton Obote to come back. So but we've seen, yes. If you say really that it's we've seen incidents of progress where ability to count votes mm. has now been decentralized. Yeah. Uh, perhaps as a result of technology constraints at the time, it was impossible to do tallying at a particular polling station, and that what the district what technology do you well. needed to count right to count now. Polling station? Right now, mm -hmm. what w happens, and uh, we've reported this severally, is the fact that sometimes what is declared at polling stations including agents of opposition parties say it is different from what is declared at the district level. Mm -hmm. The that's recent that's by like, First no. of all, like the electoral commission. These reports are there. You hear no, and no, see no, You journalists at times are just that's biased. I have been no, participating no, no, no. in the elections for the last many years. I have challenged the opposition, for instance, uh -huh. that say presidential elections, the electoral commission publishes all the results per polling station on their website. In your heart of hearts, uh, Dr. Mariomos. Yes. Do you think yes. that the reasons mm. the historicals went to war mm. in 1980 yes. are not prevalent right now for anybody to justify if, for example, unfortunately mm. they can, to go to war too? Comparing with the, what we went through after independence and today, there is no justification to go to war. Let me tell you, we got independence in 1962. Mm. And the NRM came into power in 1986. Those are 24 years. Mm. But we had elections only twice, in April 1962 and December 10th, 1980. But we had over nine presidents. So how were those presidents coming? Were Ugandans participating in electing their leaders? No. It mean the suspended parliament. There was no parliament it was leading by decree. But what do we have now? every five years. Yes, there may be some imperfections here and there. Mm. We may not be excellent, maybe 100%, but every five years, you are sure you will go to the ballot and choose the leader that you want. Allow me. An the chairman <laughs> or the president. <laughs> Allow me. Those days, yes. Those things went there. Went there. Look at the services delivered then. It is a matter it of vantage point and how you're looking at it, it but they were prevalent. 
hmm? and they are still prevalent. On what scale? So you're saying the like scale now, right now saying, is not are you sufficient saying, enough hmm? to condition dismay on the part of Ugandans? No, no, no. Let's look at the democracy and hmm. electing leaders. Are you saying today Ugandans have no voice to decide on who should lead them from the level of a president to the LC1? Are you saying I brought myself to parliament or the people of Chinchizi East decided? Have you seen the attrition rate in the parliament? When petitions, are, when petitions are filed in yes. courts of law, yes. it means there is a case for people to say our voices or our rights have been but the, good thing, the good thing, the courts are able to independently determine if there have been irregularities, they will say so and order for a by-election. Okay, allow you us... That one happening in 1980. Let's keep this conversation to General Tumwine and that particular context. I would like to ask Mr. After 1980, mm -hmm. if you were in a position to petition, probably yeah. but, should but, you dead. But, but uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> before you leave this mm. very point, mm. <laughs> you said there are dis disappearances. Mm. Who are those who have disappeared? Who, disappeared? No, because, uh, who, who are those who have disappeared? Yeah. Because you must really speak with the facts as a journalist. As a journalist, mm -hmm. we cover the news on mm -hmm. a daily basis. Yes. We report the news. Mm -hmm. We've had incidents where mm -hmm. security forces, mm -hmm. some of them drive the notorious mm -hmm. van that mm -hmm. we all know. Mm -hmm. And uh, to the extent that it has become a case of fear for people to see that kind of van within a community when it passes. Mm -hmm. Called a drone. And uh, the drone. drone. And they, are <laughs> dis we have they disappear. As a drone, you know, so for months, yeah, yeah. we have members of the National Unity Platform that were disappeared during the elections. Mm -hmm. They've never been seen yeah. up to now. Yeah. There are claims that they are incarcerated, but if they are incarcerated, why can't they be brought uh, forth? Uh, 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 aren't those the facts? Are those now, aren't those facts? Yes, a moment. Aren't those facts? Uh, no, they are not. They are not. They are not. They're just screams. First of all, first of, first of all, <laughs> first of all, wow. uh, during 2020, I mm -hmm. think it was in November, yep. when the riot happened here, and uh, some people were identified and picked, mm. right? You people joined the, the other group that opposes government to come up with very, very, very bad words. There were two, kidnap and disappearance. Mm. Huh? Kidnapping, disappearance. Now, what should it be uh, when uh, you listen, are in a community, uh, listen, just a moment, and then a drone appears, mm. and then within a minute or two, mm. uh, some people are bundled in there and they disappear. Now, uh, what are we supposed to call that? You, you know, what are we supposed to you, call that? You know, what you, you must get the facts. This you right. don't know where they went. You the must doesn't tell you where right. they've been taken Just to. A moment. You they must are not produced you, in you court. Get, you you that must is get the, right, uh, the facts right. I remember during that time, mm. in fact, uh, Honorable, I wanted to bring uh, a video for these people, right? A footage for these people, the journalists. Well. In that video, security identified very many, many, many notorious young people who hid, who disguised as mobilizers mm -hmm. of certain political groups to harass Ugandans. He actually fell a victim. He was telling you, I think he was traveling mm -hmm. all the way from his area. He fell a victim. Myself, as I was going to, to, to Mokono, I passed through Namgongo Road. Mm -hmm. I fell a victim. Very many people were actually robbed of cash, robbed of property, vehicle were, vehicles were destroyed. Now, these people did not, did not know that security had taken note of that, and they did not know that the cameras were getting them. So it was those people who were picked. And for your information, they did not disappear. The Minister for Internal Affairs I think General JJ then came out and gave Parliament mm -hmm. the list of all of those people who had been picked in that way. Just for, a moment. For the record, just a moment. And for factual reasoning, mm -hmm. the minister brought the list out after he was put under pressure. So and what? that was more than so three what? months that after. Is that is accountability. That was no problem. No, 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 no problem. problem. No problem. Really? No problem. Honorable Mbonsi. No problem. So people disappear no problem. for three no problem. months. No, what we call no problem. Disappear. First of all, he okay. brought the list. Mm. And he specified mm. the, the name of those who were arrested, where they were arrested from, yes. why they were arrested, and where right. they were kept 
in custody. Oh, very quickly. So so allow us to that the, there was no criminality around that time. In that allow us, the, allow us the, go the, for a break. This we one. shall come back was and continue this particular discussion. There yes. was criminality. How uh -huh. the state so deals with the criminality is in. something that we shall be discussing a little bit shortly when we return from this very short break. The hashtag is Morning at 10TV on Twitter. Please do stay with us. We'll be right back. A very good morning. We're glad you're still with us here on Kickstarter. We are discussing a life lived for the well General Eli Tumene, his legacy and, of course, uh, his contribution to the uh, development and, of course, uh, transformation of uh, the country. He's a man who wore, who wore many hats. He was an artist, come artist for his music. He was also, well, no doubt, one of the finest military commanders. Yesterday, while we, uh, we were interfacing with a retired Colonel Dr. Kizabesije, Kizabesije spoke of him as a rigid commander, one that had a knack for executing orders. He wanted that done and no questions as far as the plan or strategy was for any particular battle. Of course, uh, on the show we have uh, Dr. Chris Bariamusi, the Minister for ICT and National Guidance, as well as the Deputy RDC for Mukono, Mr. Henry Ichirambula. Before we went into the break, uh, the debate on criminality was uh, huge and uh, had created a little bit of uh, a flair. However, I would love to transition into the role of the military in governance. Many times it's debatable that the military is the guarantor of peace for any nation and a republic. However, the conduct of day-to-day -day duties of uh, military officers does not allow for partisan conduct. In Uganda, for the last 30 years, the military has taken on a role where it's openly partisan as a supporter of the uh, governing party, the National Resistance Movement, yet it continues to prime itself as one that works for all parties. What evidence so much so that social. when there is a confrontation between NRM party cadres and the opposition, the military seems to cover the national resistance movement and go against the opposition. Mr. Henry Chitambla, as a resident district commissioner, some of the incidents in Mukono are there for all of us to see especially during the by-election in Kayunga, where the military was deployed heavily. And when the opposition had to do their rallies, the military came hard on them. Yet, for the National Resistance Movement, it wasn't the case. That partisanness is what perhaps brought Miss, uh, General Eli Tumene into a spot of bother, and that has perhaps created a legacy that is as controversial as the man himself. Do you agree? No. First of all, our military is not partisan. And uh, uh, we interact with the many of them. Uh. Uh, recently, I was d at General Resources uh, Hall. Uh, uh, she was passing out the younger ladies and, uh, and men who had done telling. Uh. And somebody provoked her into making a, a political statement. She was uh, very bold. She said, I am not an NRM. I am a member of the UPDF. That's a single soldier speaking. Many of them have done okay. so. Many of them have done so. Now, what you must do know, mm. uh, at times you see the army in public for a genuine reason. Number one, we have been having ADF threat and what have you, and uh, according to the law or the deployment, uh, 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 procedure, uh. the police can call on the military at any time for reinforcement. And at times no when doubt. you see that reinforcement, you think now the military is taking over. The answer is no. F for us, we are in security. In fact, the commander, when you see police and the military moving together, the commander is always the DPC. Not the military person, but the DPC of the area. So they always call for, for the, the, the reinforcement. But what you must also know is that there is a category of people uh, who are trying to, to make our politics dirty. They provoke security. They provoke government. They want to take power by hook or crook, you see. And at times they, they cause that kind of that kind of tension. They overwhelm police, and the police has really to, to ask the military to come 
and do some bit of reinforcement. However, on a very serious note, leaving your politics aside, the Wanainchi love to see UPDF coming to reinforce police. My boss is here. When I was in Machi, India, during those very important days, Christmas, ED, people could come and flood at my office. And the answer was, please, assist us. At least military police should come and work with the police, say that we eat our Christmas well. So people are happy when they see, when they see the military. Now, on the issue of Kayunga you're talking about, I even heard those who are talking about Busongora, the deployment in Busongora, as if they don't know that Busongora is one of the uh, the, 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 the black spot for, 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 for ADF. Hmm? When we went for the last polls, the 2021 presidential and parliamentary elections, because of the provocation they had staged in the, the November riots, mm -hmm. they thought we are going to man the polling stations with the military. To the contrary, it wasn't. If you, you remember, because you covered the elections, even the army being in the parliament, because I've heard people talking about, it's because of the history. The army used to cause a lot of havoc in the, in the country. All the coups you hear about, you read about, the coups are not done by, <laughs> by, 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 by police. They are done by the military, right? Now, because of the historical background, we wanted as an army, I'm, and I'm using the word NRM government <laughs> because I'm, I'm also non-partisan by virtue of my appointment. Oh. It's only him who is, the, who, who is partisan because mm. he's the chairperson, uh, vice chairperson of uh, a very important very region. Partisan. Yes, so he's <laughs> very, very partisan. <laughs> so uh, we wanted the military to actually come close to the civilians, come close to the civilians. So if you have a house, like our parliament here, we don't want them to take a decision or to make a law or to do A, B, C, D, or C, and then the military men are behind or out the house barking and maybe threatening. We want them to be part of what is taking place, much as they, they may not vote, but they, they always part and parcel of what is actually uh, uh, takes place in the parliament. We have also introduced what we call CIMIC, civil military uh, uh, co cooperation. Uh. So you have seen the military coming uh, to the to, to, to the public, especially during the sita, they clean, they make contributions, they work hand in hand with the with the civilians because we want actually the civilians to own their army. To really feel good when working with the army, and you want the army also these army officers, the, the the military officers, also to know that the people, the public, the public is why they exist. Because without the public, they cannot guard. All right. They cannot work. Thank you for that. As, uh, thank you for officers. that uh, submission, Honourable uh, Doctor Chris Pariomosi, yes. General Eli Tumine was known challenge he was very unequivocal in his defense of the role of the military in governance and to be part and parcel of the decision making process however we saw that kind of uh, sentiment bordering on entitlement uh, that we are the generation that sacrificed and that we should be there to ensure that what we did is not outdone but in the process of doing that we've seen so much of abuse of uh, this particular privilege that could have been accorded eternally to the group that uh, waged the war in 1981 don't you think a legacy has been shattered but, but in, in your question you are sounding much more partisan than even the army you are choosing <laughs> no and yet even you as a journalist you're supposed to be <laughs> and partisan and neutral you see first of all the post-independence army mm -hmm. caused a lot of havoc in this country. Actually, the situation then was, if you see a soldier, you run away. The situation today is, if somebody attacks you and there's a soldier standing there, you run to the soldier. And that's the remarkable difference. So there is a reason why the Constituent Assembly agreed that the army should sit in the parliament. 
to connect the army with the politics. When, for instance, the army is paid poorly, they understand because they are represented in the parliament. When we discuss the budget and they see resource envelope being inadequate, they can be able to understand. Otherwise, if they are disconnected with the politics, they can cause a coup, they can start fighting because they think we politicians are not paying them well. So there was that deliberate effort to connect the army with the political environment for them to understand. And uh, the army has been in parliament. What abuse have you had uh, about the UPDF MOPs in the parliament? They actually listening posts. They sit there to listen, to connect with the political world. But also the constitution says every five years we review the representation of special interest groups in the parliament, the army, the women, persons with disability, the youth, the older persons, and in the wisdom of parliament and uh -huh. Ugandans, I think Ugandans think it is still important to keep them in the army. Well, the, the abuses, there may be isolated incidences, but you cannot say the army in Uganda abuses Ugandans. Really? Do you know in the past, the soldier was paid by his gun uh, especially like in the Minzi government. The gun was what was guaranteeing the motivation and the payment of the soldier. Do you know there were roadblocks where soldiers would just get out of buses and rape your wife or your sister there when you are seeing? We have gone through that. But now, can a soldier today, for instance, board a bus and fails to pay? People will lynch him will lead him. This is a fundamental departure from what we saw in the mm -hmm. past. So before you say they are abuses by the army and so forth, I think that's how I said that's the, you, the young people, because you don't want to connect with the past. But looking at where we are coming from, there may be imperfections, yes. There may be individual soldiers who get indisciplined, but also there is a mechanism within the army and the establishment that an army officer, a soldier, who is indisciplined can be punished. And there are many who have been punished. But you cannot say on a whole that the army in Uganda or security forces abuse Ugandans. They're actually very disciplined. Yeah. The UPDF is one of the most disciplined armies that we have on the continent. On the continent. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for that uh, particular submission. It's a debate, of course, that uh, within some circles mm -hmm. it, go, it could go on until the chickens come up to roost. Mm -hmm. But for this particular discussion, allow me to uh, ask you for your what you make of the fact that politicians today, mm -hmm. including military leaders, because uh, many times it's in increasingly difficult to distinguish, especially when uh, an army man comes out and speaks on policy aspects M very much uh, something that Tumine uh, used to do and uh, he could get away with it but going forward Tumine was an MP was a minister <laughs> so you don't want to talk about the policy, <laughs> the policy matters uh, sometimes when you speak about policy when you're speaking as a member of parliament it's important that you put the military jacket off however if you use what do you mean by policy if you use the podium of uh, of an MP to speak on issues that you would but, as ideally but, but speak policy on is as a general, from, uh, as a general, as a message, as a general. If, are you saying the soldier can't say, no. "You children, you go to general, school." General, general Tumene, school. general Tumene <laughs> could use those with a little bit of fluidity. You couldn't know what who is speaking at that particular time, but you could clearly see uh, the man. The fact that he spoke his mind, no doubt about that. Earlier, you alluded to the fact that there are Ugandans who like to not to speak what they mean mm. or not to even mean what mm. they, yeah, speak, they speak and that uh, perhaps we should take him as a blessing uh, the fact that he aired out his views. He was a member of parliament, he was a minister. Uh -huh. And what do ministers do? They articulate the government policy. Are you saying as a minister for security, he shouldn't have articulated the security policy in the, in the country? What are you saying? The scandal that I alluded to earlier on normal gallery, he responded more like a military general than a minister or... <laughs> no, 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 he challenged those who are choosing him. So I think where you, the should, be, you should, should be able to understand to where I'm coming from on the that. Agreements mm. are fraudulent and so what does this mean for the national resistance movement going forward? Mm. Uh, leading member of the uh, liberation struggle is gone. Mm. 
and uh, the party needs to be able to look more mm. to identify those that can still inculcate the ideals of the liberation. Yes, first of all, answering the earlier question, mm. what took these liberators to the bush? Was it justified? Are they still then? on course? Yes. Has something been achieved? Definitely. No, enormously. Definitely. No doubt. Whether the, if I look at the four cardinal principal pillars of NRM, patriotism, I think a spirit of patriotism has been inculcated in us Ugandans. Pan Africanism, social economic transformation. Mm. Are there a visible sign that Uganda has transformed? Definitely, no, definitely yes. If you look at how Uganda was in the 70s, 80s, in terms of social economic indicators, uh -huh. and you look at how it is today, there is a fundamental change that has occurred in Uganda. Whether you, you agree with the NRM or you, you don't, but a lot of the changes in the quality of life are very visible. Uh -huh. Democracy. Have we made a milestone in the democratic processes? Definitely, yes. So. Yes, we have lost General Tumine, but I am sure the liberators are proud oh. that, that what they went to the bush to fight for is being achieved. It's a journey. We may not have reached a position of excellence where everything has been achieved, oh. but there is remarkable progress okay. from where we began and where we are. And what remains is for all of us who have never had the chance to go to the bush to take on the revolution mm -hmm. and continue to work for Ugandans and continue to improve the quality of life of Ugandans. The problem I see is there is a tendency of radicalizing politics, mm -hmm. uh, having extremist voices, mm -hmm. that if you are opposition and I'm NRM, people want to take us as enemies. I think no. there is a need. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's a tendency, you, there's a that tendency for the national resistance movement cadres, including cabinet ministers, to use that to their advantage, the radicalization oh. of politics. You. When you use it to your advantage Who against opposition, then that means Who you is are radicalizing politics in Uganda, in your view? Many politicians. I don't want to go political. I don't want, I don't want to go personal right opposition now. Opposition and NRM. Uh -huh. Who is radicalizing politics? So many the reports are seen here. Which we reports? do cover them on <laughs> the news. So ideally, <laughs> you shouldn't step away from really? that particular really? characterization. Do you know why if this is breaking down? Do you know, for instance? I have my own investigations. The reason is there have been two sharp tendencies. There are those who think we should be civilized in doing our politics. Mm. They like some Mujisha Muntu and uh, his group. Then there are those who think <laughs> when they come for a talk show, they should come with a stone in the pocket mm. ah, and stone somebody. No. That's why there was that uh, split, a uh, fracture in the party. Mm. You look at the loop. The way right. the members are radicalized, hey. the so-called riots you are talking about. That's right. Was it justified to? All right, that's a debate that can go down. on for hours, and uh, so we can't keep it for another day. The point day. I am making that yeah, please, we may be ideologically different in mm. terms of our political persuasion is, mm. but we should all know we are Ugandans mm. and we want a better Uganda. Mm. And we can mm. coexist mm. even when we are in different political. Your parties. closing remarks, mm. Henry yes. Chitamla. Mm. For me. Uh, First of all, I want to thank God mm. that uh, we have lived to see uh, General Eri Tumwine mm. up to just a few days when he, he passed on. Mm. If he had uh, maybe died on mm. 1st November 1981, wouldn't, some of us wouldn't have, have, known, him. have known him. And himself couldn't have contributed uh, to the national development as he has actually done. So we thank God for that. Okay. Lastly, <coughs> to our friends, those who are younger than me, this Uganda is ours. We may have political differences. We may have differences in religion, religious beliefs, in the tribes. But when somebody contributes immensely to the development of your society, your country kindly appreciate the contribution. There are for those who have been uh, circulating uh, misjudged messages about the late General Eric Mwene, kindly think twice and know that uh, you are there 
we don't know you and we shouldn't actually know you okay. by the misjudgment. All right, thank you very so much, thank you very much uh, and Enrich Tambla. May the uh, may General El Tumwini rest. rest in eternal peace. Oh, thank you very much. An African and an Ugandan yes. to start attacking somebody who has passed on. All right. Yeah, Thank you very so much, uh, Henry Tambla, the resident deputy resident uh, district commissioner for Mukono, as well as uh, Dr. Chris Paramusi. Many thanks for making time. Your minister for ICT and national guidance, giving us your recollections of uh, General Eli Tumine, a life well lived. Now, for those that uh, are heading for the uh, last uh, ceremony that will see the interment of the remains of the general, please. Uh,